the most extraordinary falls in poverty have come in those African countries that have opened their market and joined the global system. And if the rest of the continent follows, then I think Africa has an extremely bright future. Welcome to another video in the IATP Explainer Series. This week, we are joined by Dan Hannon. Lord Hannon of Kingsglare is a former member of the European Parliament, the founder and president of the Initiative for Free Trade, the author of 11 books, and he currently serves on the United Kingdom's Board of Trade. Why should less developed countries embrace free trade? Isn't it important for countries to protect their infant industries? The idea of protecting infant industries is one of the most persistent myths. I think it goes back to Alexander Hamilton at the beginning of the American Republic. And like a lot of protectionism, like a lot of mercantilism, it sounds plausible, but it turns out to be completely specious. There have been various claims made, not least about the early American Republic, that you know the, the, the country grew faster while it had protection, South Korea or whatever. And yet every time there is a serious academic analysis, serious uh, quantifiable analysis, it always turns out that the impact of the protection was slower growth. That's not to say zero growth, right? You, you, you can be growing for other reasons, but that slower growth than it would have otherwise been. Uh, th 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 there were very serious studies of Brazil and other places, and it, 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 it is a constant wherever you look. But of course, it's, it's intuitive. Uh, it, it, it's like so many of these things, it stands to reason, uh, you know, like the idea that you need to grow your own food or or the idea that you can't compete with, with slave wage economies or the idea that you need to, to have certain strategic industries. All of these things make sense, all of them, when turned into policy, make a country poorer. The, the easiest way to answer this, the easiest way to answer the infant industries point is to ask the following question. Why do we blockade enemy belligerents during a war? You know, to, to answer that question. What, what are we doing when we try and cut off the trade of a hostile power, right? We're, we're trying to make them poorer. Yes, we're trying to uh, we're, 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 we're trying to put pressure on them, uh, hasten their defeat. Yeah, can we all agree that we're not doing it to nurture their infant industries, right? We're not trying to make the enemy more competitive so that they can come into global markets in a stronger position, right? Protectionism, whether you're doing it in the infant industry stage or any other, is doing to yourself in peacetime what the enemy tries to do to you in war. And what you find when you've started nurturing the infant industries is that they never grow up. They remain infantilized industries. They remain permanently dependent on government support. They put more and more energy into lobbying and rent seeking. And you never get to the point where they've grown up enough that they can compete like the sugar industry in the US. They become a permanent dependent at permanent disadvantage. And that is something that developing countries, uh, it, it takes a lot of courage to do this because you've got party donors saying, well, you know, rice is a special case in our country or whatever. But developing countries that go down that road always end up inflicting needless poverty on their people. How can the UK help those in the developing world? Is more foreign aid the answer? Whenever we look at the impact of foreign aid, whether we look at comparable countries, which are in receipt of it or not, or the same country in periods when they are getting foreign aid and when they're not, we find that almost always, not always, but almost always, the effect is negative, right? Just think about that for a second. Not just, it's not just useless. It's not just a waste of money. It is actively bad. It retards democratic development and it retards economic development. Why? Because it encourages people to arrange their affairs around qualifying for the pot of money rather than creating wealth. And it encourages politicians in the recipient country to try and place themselves between the source of the revenue and whatever it is uh, that it's supposed to be building. So, you know, yes, very, very happy to accept aid to build this, uh, you know, green steel plant or whatever it is. But you know, the regional governor, the local senator, the local council, they've all got their hands out. And so it, it, it is, it vitiates, uh, it vitiates democratic development, and it keeps a country poorer. Uh, the, the wonderful thing about free trade is it is an automatic leveler up. Uh, countries that begin with, if you like, the disadvantages of 
uh, cheap wages and low living standards find that those things are advantageous when it comes to pricing themselves into the market. And indeed, they lose those advantages as they get richer, right? So everybody wins. But the, the, the wealthier countries uh, do better because they are trading with wealthier people, which makes them better off. And the developing countries also uh, raise their living standards. So by far, the best thing you can do is to trade your way out of poverty. Your initiative for free trade recently released a paper about the African continental free trade area. What were some of its key findings? It's a good thing that the African continental free trade area is being set up. It is important in doing this to look at what other regional trade associations have done so as to avoid some of the mistakes and emphasize or accentuate some of the successes. So uh, there are trade associations that have become customs unions, like the European Union, and there are trade associations that are just about mutual recognition and uh, tariff reduction and, and easier commerce, like ASEAN or NAFTA. Uh, all, all of these are unique, of course, and, and, and Africa has its unique circumstances. But by and large, the stronger bits of, of the proposed um, plan are those which are about uh, removing barriers, and uh, the less strong bits are the bits which talk about self-sufficiency and, and so on. Uh, trade is about swapping on the back of differences. Right? Um, the best kind of trade association is the one that brings together very varied economies, that brings together uh, agrarian and commodity-based and industrial and service-based economies, and, and, and allows each country to specialise and, and generates more wealth for everyone. The idea of, of creating regional blocks, which is very much the European Union way of doing things, and, and they try to export that model to South America and indeed to Africa, falls at the first hurdle, right? I mean, if you're, I mean, let, let's take this away from Africa. Let, let's say you're uh, a country in Central America to, to look at other agrarian and commodity-based economies. Why do you want to form a Central American Union and sell each other coffee and cut flowers and uh, you know um, uh, uh, and other basic foodstuffs, uh, bananas and so on? You, 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 what you want is to be able to sell those things at advantage to people who can't make them or can't make them except expensively and buy stuff that uh, that you can't make. Um, and so the best bits in AFCTA are about liberalization. I think, by the way, it's worth just saying there are things the rest of the world could be doing. Uh, it, it is extraordinary, for example, that the EU's rules on GM prohibit importation of safe and nutritious foodstuffs from Africa. Uh, banana blight is one of the biggest uh, uh, depreciators of cash crops is one of the worst things that can happen uh, in terms of, uh, of agriculture in the Great Lakes region. There is a GM solution to it. But the EU doesn't recognize it. Uh, and, and so if you if you use GM to secure your banana crop against this particular blight, it's not just the, the GM treated bananas, but all the bananas in your country then can't be imported. And so there are, there are things that the rest of the world can be doing as well. But uh, but my advice to any African leaders watching this is now focus on the implementation. And it, it's great to have declarations of the removal of, of barriers. If when you cross the border, you find that there is still a cumbersome and clunky procedure, then it doesn't matter what declarations you've passed, right? You have to make sure that those declarations have effect on the ground. Uh, but potentially, this is a very, very positive and significant development. Why are you optimistic about Africa's future? I think Africa has been the great success story of the 21st century, uh, most obviously in terms of growth rates, right? uh, which have been spectacular despite the global financial crisis, despite the lockdowns. Uh, of course, those things have hurt Africa as they've hurt every other country, but most other continents would gladly swap their growth rates uh, for Africa's. 
but also in, t- in terms of more obvious measurements, if you like, right, that the, the, those higher growth rates feed into higher longevity, uh, higher literacy, lower infant mortality, uh, more years of, of, of girls' education and so on. And uh, on any of those measures, things are better and are getting better faster. Not everywhere, of course, right? We're, we're, we're talking about an incredibly large, diverse continent. It has patches of, of deprivation and it has immense regional challenges. It has political instability in some countries, wars in some places. But by and large, I think the uh, the, the, the the story is a, is a happy one. And by the way, I think the rest of the world has been, again, very slow to wake up to this. We We tend to... And if you're my sort of age, your your view of Africa was formed, you know, in the eighties by charity appeals and by news reports of civil wars, and the the, the 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 image that people had of Africa then was of you know starving children with bloated bellies and and flies crawling over their faces, or or child warriors with with pangas and so on, and of course. Those stereotypes do not survive first contact, right? I mean, it, it is extraordinary the first time you go to Africa to see the, the 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 industriousness of people, how busy they are, how enterprising, uh, and how optimistic. Um, uh, honestly, I think a lot of this has to do with the demographic situation. Um, I remember having this conversation with a group of MPs in Uganda, and they were, I think, Uganda then had the youngest population. In the world, uh, the average age of Uganda then was fourteen or something, and people were saying, "Oh, this is such a problem. You know, how are we going to find jobs for all these young people? It's such a challenge. What are we going to do?" Uh, and I was saying, "Look, guys, you know, imagine you had the opposite problem. I- imagine that you were Russia or Greece. Imagine that you had lots and lots of pensioners and no young people. Then you would have a problem, right?" Trust me, those countries would swap their demographic problems for your problems. And it is not the job of politicians to worry about creating jobs. The the, the jobs will follow from the growing wealth as long as the government gets out of the way and allows uh, the enterprise of a free people to be uh, unleashed. And so, uh, you know, I'm optimistic about property rights. I'm optimistic about uh, accountable government. But above all, I'm optimistic about economic growth, provided, provided that we can withstand the temptations of mercantilism, of protectionism, provided we can stand up against the always popular but always wrong argument that says we need to build our own stuff, we need to be more self-sufficient, we need to look after our own people, all of those policies whether they come from Donald Trump, whether they come from Jeremy Corbyn, or whether they come from any African leader, serve to make a country needlessly poor. The most extraordinary falls in poverty have come in those African countries that have opened their market and joined the global system. And if the rest of the continent follows, then I think Africa has an extremely bright future. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to follow the IATP on Twitter at the underscore IATP. Also, hit the like and subscribe button below and check out our website at www.theiatp.org.